Welcome back to Martins and More. My name's Maury Rutsch. And I'm Spoon Phillips. And I'm Taya Gurkin. There you go. How about that? He's in the podcast. <laughs> He's in the building! <laughs> Taya Gurkin, thank you very much for being here. you got to tell us all about what you're doing here. It's great to be here. How on earth did Maury land you? This is awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, it's easy to twist my arm. What's the guy um, from Saturday Night Live who <laughs> would always have sweaty palms and he's interviewing celebrities? <laughs> um. <laughs> I can give a little um, thumbnail of, of who I am if we want to start like that. My name is Taya Gherkin, and a lot of people wonder how to pronounce my name if they've only seen me in writing. Of course, these days on video, I usually say my name on the beginning of the video, so maybe it's become a little less of a mystery. Um, I uh, was born and spent the first 16 years of my life in Germany, um, still have family there, but my whole immediate family moved to California in 1986. Started playing guitar uh, as a fairly small child. My dad plays guitar and so, uh, you know, learned a few basic chords and then um, as a teenager, we were living near Munich in Germany and I took some classes at a, a little music school there. Uh, which is where I first learned to play, thing, to do some finger picking. Uh, started to learn House of the Rising Sun. Um, then um, went to high school and college uh, in California uh, and took private lessons with sort of a, a variety of teachers. Uh, my first teacher was a guy named George Quinn, who I recently reconnected with. He's now down in Santa Barbara and we hadn't seen each other in 25 years. and. Uh, ran across each other. Well, actually, first on Facebook and then at a guitar festival, which was fantastic. Um, in college, I spent six months living in Michoacan, Mexico, and lived in the guitar making village of Paracho, and uh, lived with a luthier down there, and we built a guitar together, which I still have, uh, which is the only time that I was involved, was actually involved in building a guitar myself, and it was fantastic. It was really my introduction to the whole thing. Uh, after I graduated, I worked at a uh, small guitar store called Tall Toad Music in Petaluma, California for five years. And um, that was kind of my introduction to the industry, as we, as we want to, if we want to call it that. Uh, I started going to NAM shows and just kind of, you know, being around lots of guitars. Uh, at that time, started studying. I studied some flamenco guitar and classical guitar with a local teacher, and then I hooked up with Pepino D'Agostino and got really serious about playing fingerstyle guitar. And then through a friend of mine who at the time was the music editor at Acoustic Guitar Magazine, Dylan Shora, uh, ended up being hired as the gear editor for Acoustic Guitar in 1997. And uh, had that job, uh, well, until 2013, I, I was senior editor for the last few years of that. And then that sort of ran its course. And I co-founded Peghead Nation with uh, Dan Gable and Scott Nygaard. And uh, that's other than playing, the main thing I do now is I'm the producer for Peghead Nation. I'm in our studio right now. And we, uh, of course, uh, are primarily an education platform. We have almost 70 courses now for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, ukulele, basically all the roots music, fretted and stringed instruments. And um, I still managed to put out the occasional CD. You mentioned I just put out a new solo album called Test of Time. And I also frequently work with Doug Young in a duo. And uh, um, so I think you guys mentioned that uh, in one of your podcasts uh, at one point. So we appreciate that. So that's, um, I don't know, did I do that in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so having said all that, Taya, I know that I briefly, really briefly met you at a NAMM show uh, 56 years ago or whatever it was, and it was just a matter of saying hello, and you and I were both running in different directions. I shouldn't assume anything, but I, I feel like you guys know each other. No, actually, we just know of each other, I think. <laughs> I think online. Yeah, really only online. So It's um, true. I also ran into Taya at a NAMM show, and... Um, 
I don't remember what year it was. I just remember it was one of those nighttime events where you were standing in line oh, right. waiting to get in. And I remember yeah. somebody coming up and, and, you know, saying they were glad to meet you and referred you as TJ. And it's, I've, I have heard every, every way to pronounce my name, believe me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, it's... I have a question for you, Teja. Were you christened Teja? Yes. It is not a German name. It is a, it, it, it's a name that comes from India. and Exactly. I it's Hindu. It, yeah, it's a, it's I a hit, Hindu I had hippie parents, yeah. and uh, that's, yeah. how, that's, how, that's how that all came about, yes. I wondered about that, because that same spelling is, exists, that same spelling exists in a name in other regions of the world, and I wondered if it had anything to do with the Hindu, uh, you know, Godhead or what. So here's the amazing thing. The only other person I've ever met with my name is a guy who pronounces it Teja, Teja Bell, who's a fantastic guitar player who lives in the same town as me. And we, we <laughs> perform as a duo sometimes. So we do Teja and Teja. And I, I've no. gotten around the world and he is the only person I've ever met. And I live in Fairfax, California. It's a town of about 7,500 people. And uh, there he is. It is incredible. And we're friends. We get along. That's amazing. And, it's, <laughs> and he's a guitar player. And he's a guitar player. He plays acoustic <laughs> finger style and classical guitar. So it is really quite phenomenal. Indeed. So we... And there's a chance we don't have the best tag on camera today. That sucks. There's a good chance of that, yeah. Uh. Well, you, uh, you've been a, a Northern Californian ever since you moved to the States, is that correct? Yes, yes, uh, with a brief time in Mexico for six months. Mm. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, I've lived in the greater Bay Area since uh, 1986. And how far away are you from Eric's shop in... Uh, well, I was there on Tuesday. Uh, I'm there. I'm about 20 minutes away from there. Ah, uh, boy, that's gonna suck. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, we are blessed in the Bay Area. We have, uh, you know, there's Eric's shop. We have, of course, Griffin Stringed Instruments in Palo Alto. We have Stevie Cole's shop uh, in Lafayette. And Tall Todd Music, the shop that I used to work at, which is a little north of here, uh, is a wonderful shop, too. So, And Guitar Solo in San Francisco for classical guitars is really fantastic. So we really are blessed with a pretty, a pretty amazing array of acoustic guitar specialty shops around I'll here. I'll say. I'll say, and wow. Steve Swan is what, is he over, he's west of there, isn't he? And Steve Swan is down, he's down near the airport, and it, he's sort of a by appointment only kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, it's wonderful too. I just saw him at the uh, Amigos Guitar Show uh, a month or so ago. Yeah, you also have great guitar shows. <laughs> We wow. get the that occasional too. guitar show. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny, you know, you joke about 56 years ago meeting at NAM. Uh, it hasn't been quite that much, uh, <laughs> but I have been going to NAM. I think I figured it out for about 30 years. So it's, um, yeah. Wow. And I used to go to the Nashville show as well. So I probably have gone to 40 plus NAM shows. <laughs> Amazing. I think I've gone to like five, but I, it's been a long time since I was there and well, I don't know how we must have all been at NAMM shows since we were like nine years old, because I don't think any of us are over like 42. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <clears throat> it's nice of you not to make fun of your elders, young whippersnapper. Actually, <laughs> I'm going to say the last cringeworthy thing on this program, and the rest is going to be smooth sailing. I'm almost sure both of you had a birthday recently, and I'm, I'll go so far as to say, I bet you were born within 24 hours. Am I right to say you both had birthdays on the 25th and the 26th? 28th for 28th. me. 28th. Oh, so his, yours was, people don't uh, know when we're actually taping this. We're actually taping this on the 1st of March. So, uh, right. so yeah, I and my birthday buddy, George Harrison, celebrated our birthdays on, uh, hold on one second. Oh, uh, there you go. Turn that off. Um, but that's probably somebody calling to wish me a late birthday. Uh, <laughs> there you go. A, a greeting. Um, so, and the 28th. Well, happy birthday to you both. I was in January. It's old news, but... Well, thank you. Thank you. We're going to talk about a few different topics today, all centered around Taya. And I want to start with picking the first one to say that your recent album is amazing, but I, it left me with a taste in my mouth after listening to one of the tracks. I'm a little bit, more than a little bit upset that I'm the only one in present company that does not know how to finger pick a 12 string. Which song am I talking about on your new album? Uh, is that a trick question, or do you want me? Do you want me to answer that? There's two. There's two twelve string cuts on there. Well, and now I wish I'd brought my twelve string. 
I recorded uh, a version of John Coltrane's Naima on 12-string guitar. And there's an original of mine called Tacoma uh, that is sort of inspired by uh, the early Tacoma Records artists. I, I wrote it after seeing Leo Kotke one night. And um, so, yeah, those, those are two 12-string cuts on that album. I've had a 12-string cut on each one of my other albums. On Postcards, I recorded uh, a tune of Dale Miller's called Noe Valley Sunday on 12-string. And uh, my first record, On My Way, has a tune called Berlin at 2 a.m. that I haven't played in 20 plus years, mm -hmm. but it is a 12-string cut. And uh, I didn't play 12-string on the album with Doug Young, but he did. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, the, there's a video of you playing the Kotke-inspired one on the internet. Um, yeah. What, who made the guitar? That's a Taylor 355. Okay, I couldn't tell from, from seeing it watching on my phone <laughs> if, if it was an actual stock Taylor, but it is. It's a, well, it is basically. Uh, I did order it uh, from them, and they made me one uh, that it has no fingerboard inlay, so it's a plain fingerboard, um, which I like. Uh, and, um, but otherwise, it's a stock 355. It was made in 2000, and uh, it's been a great guitar. I mean, it's not an expensive guitar, but it's the only 12-string. A 355? So what are the woods from that? From, you said it's, from 2000. It's Sapele, Sapele back and sides and a Sitka spruce top. Uh, and it's the original jumbo style. You know, they, they don't make that style anymore. Um, and uh, I'm now toying with the idea of maybe doing some more 12 string recordings and a good friend of mine just lent me a Leo Kotke signature model so well they're fan yeah they're fantastic I've got one tuned low and one tuned to standard pitch so I'm really going down the deep end with Do you that. turn down to C sharp like or how, how far down yeah you go? well and then I usually go to dadgad from there I mostly play the 12 string in dadgad uh, even though that tune Tacoma is basically in an open G tuning with the low C. So it's uh, C, G, D, G, B, D. Very cool. Yes, yeah. I know you certainly like your alternate tunings. I, I had an opportunity to get a Kotke signature model from the first year of production. Oh, yeah, had great. a dual source in it, and it was at a li tiny little town in southern Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get somebody to go play it first, and somebody bought it out from under me before the guy got to the store. <laughs> right, too bad. Oh. Those are great guitars. Uh, and I would say this 355 that I've had, I mean, I've had it for now for 24 years almost. And uh, it's a wonderful guitar and it's not an expensive guitar. And, uh, you know, it's the only 12 string I've ever recorded with. And uh, it, it doesn't always come out to a gig. But, um, you know, a lot of times uh, if I play a solo gig, like a long solo gig, I'll, I'll try to bring a 12 string along or a nylon string. Can I ask you to repeat that, Taya? Because a lot of people need to hear it. That's an excellent guitar, and it's not expensive. You wouldn't believe how many people fall down a rabbit hole of let me chase and chase and chase and climb past. I, I bet you a lot of people listening to this program climb past a lot of obvious alternatives, reaching for the guitar they think is going to be the one. Oh. And not to put words in your mouth, but I think it's important that people listening recognize that there's a great guitar at so many different price points. Oh, and absolutely. Brands. There are... I mean, they, the times have never been better for really excellent, affordable instruments. Um, I think guitars like the Taylor 3 and 400 series, um, which aren't that cheap anymore. I mean, they're creeping up in the $2,500 range now or something like that. I think all the Martin 16 series guitars are fantastic guitars. Things like the new, the Bojoa Touchstones, which are, you know, that co collaboration with Eastman, they're really excellent. Eastman guitars are ah. fantastic. There are a lot of guitars that I wouldn't hesitate to, you know, use all the time in the $1,500 to $3,000 range easily. There's so many great guitars. Well, I just played a guitar the other night at a rehearsal um, for an upcoming gig, and somebody had just given the guy this guitar, and it's a Mitchell, which is oh, one yeah. of the real low-end ones. That's a, that's a Guitar Center house brand, I think. Oh, is it a house brand? I thought it might be, but it, it yeah. had, I mean, it sounded... Mm -hmm. really similar to a lot of Gibsons in terms of mm -hmm. the bottom end and how the string mm -hmm. sounded. I was surprised at 
the Gibson esque sound to the guitar, yeah. and they they basically go for a song. They're not expensive also, at all. Oh, so you know some of the like recording kings and Blue Ridges, and uh, actually the Taylor Academy series uh, is pretty impressive for that kind of money, and um, and. Uh, you know, even some of the, uh, well, I've always liked the Martin 15 series, uh, which I think are great guitars. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the feel and the playability, even some of the, like, the X series Martins, I think, are very nice guitars. And uh, some of them sound really good plugged in. You had mentioned Kaki. Uh, we talked about him. I actually saw him, this is many years ago now, with a, mm -hmm. a triple O, what they now call a triple O. Uh, 15 SM. Oh, yeah, I remember he was playing that for a while. Yeah. 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 That he had just, you know, his something broke on his guitar and he just picked it off the rack and then he spent mm -hmm. the entire night complaining about not having enough frets. But uh, it was 12 fret yeah. guitar, but but still very cool sounding. And oh, yeah. Certainly a great yeah. finger style guitar and, you know, in any respect. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I don't want to say the term speaking about guitars because, of course, we're going to speak about guitars all day. Is it now time to ask you about your personal guitars? Sure, we can do that. Uh, I brought two of them. Um, well, I have I have a question about that right now. Okay. The the video that that with this tune from your new album, uh, you're playing a Loudon. Yeah, I have that here. It's like a sepia tone video, so I can't really tell <laughs> if it was a cedar top or what it Why is. Why don't we start with that? It's it's this one right here. So this is a. Uh, Loudon O10 uh, that I bought in 1999, so I've had it for 25 years, and uh, I bought it at an amp show, and it's kind of the original, mo you can't get more Loudon than this, it's mahogany back and sides, <laughs> and a cedar top, and the original jumbo body, this is kind of like the, the first guitar that George built that you'd recognize as a Loudon was basically this guitar, and uh, it's been a really good instrument. Wow. Um, it's, uh, it's very powerful. I bought it because I wanted a powerful guitar. I, uh, I was playing this regular guitar showcase in San Francisco at a little cafe, and we were doing it with no amplification. And um, I played some Loudons, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd seen Pierre Ben Suzanne play, and that was sort of the, the big influence. Um, but uh, my friend Tom Long had one, and um, some other folks. And it's just been a great guitar. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful fingerstyle guitar. It's um, when I'm playing a house concert or anything with, with no uh, amplification, it just really, it's, it's unbeatable. And uh, it also records really well. It's on about half the six string cuts on the new album. It's on a bunch of the tracks with Doug. Um, and it's just been a really wonderful guitar. My first experience with cedar and mahogany with Loudons, and, and then I played one. You may know who this is, because I can't remember his name. Uh, Acoustic Guitar Magazine, we had an open mic here in Brooklyn a zillion years ago. Oh, yeah. And um, and a fella had a guitar by a builder. He was living in Indiana at that time, and then he, but he moved off to somewhere else. I don't remember who it is, but it was about a double O size. Okay. And it was and it was uh, supposedly Cuban mahogany and, and cedar, but what a marvelous uh, combination of woods for they, tone. They can be great. Interestingly enough, um, more often than not, I I don't like guitars with cedar tops, but um, this one I really like. Um, yeah, I'm not, so, I don't like it with rosewood and cedar. Has never done it for me. It's too I don't know mushy sounding, I guess, compared to a spruce. But and there's something yeah, about can, mahogany and cedar. Especially on a smaller guitar, I find that cedar can get a little brash sounding. Sight unseen, I probably wouldn't risk it. I would probably go with a spruce top. Uh, but again, this guitar is fantastic. Uh, I find most Loudons really work well with the cedar top. You know, he was really one of the first ones to introduce cedar tops to steel string guitars. Uh, classical makers had used them, of course, for a long time. Um, and, you know, I think Ramirez was really the one that started it there uh, in Spain. And uh, I think Loudon and maybe Filed over in England, they were kind of the first ones to use cedar on a steel string. And um, a lot of people, of course, are doing it now. And they do have that quick response. And uh, the, it's a lot of power. And uh, a lot of people find that they don't work so well for flat picking. And I would agree with that for like a single note kind of, you know, single note picking fiddle tunes or something like that but this guitar strums really great i don't have a pick on me right now but um 
Uh, it's a powerful. A lot of Irish backup players use these, and it just really sounds phenomenal. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great of course, guitar. they're and often playing in dadgad, so you get that lower bass getting out of it as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so this has been a great guitar. I mean, like I said, I've had it for 25 years, and um, and uh, uh, I hope to play it another 25 years. Well, Teo, we have a we have a saying around here called "less talky, more rocky." Okay, would you play that for us? Sure. Yeah. Why don't I play? Um, uh, you, you referred to a video that I put out, which is a tune of mine called "Vicky's uh, Red Boots" that I wrote for Vicky Genfan, and I'll play that for you. Uh, it goes like this. Yeah, really nice. Thank you. Thank you. What is yeah. that microphone you're playing into? Uh, it's a Ear Trumpet Labs Edwina. And uh, actually, I have also have another mic above me that you can't see on camera. That's uh, just an Audio T uh, Technica AT2020. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Lovely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, uh, you asked about tunings earlier. So this is in uh, C, G, D, G, G, D tuning. So the second and third string are in unison. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. we uh, did a podcast about alternate tunings just recently. Yeah. So I think I think uh, Preston Reed uses this tuning as well. Uh, kind of gives you that. I mean, it's almost a twelve-string kind of a sound you get there because you have that dulcimer-like unison thing going on. So that's really neat. Our yeah. listeners are getting a lot of more. We're Martins and more every week. And week after week after week, it's Martin, Martin, Martin. This is a good more episode, if you ask me. Well, I yeah, can, absolutely. I mean, I did bring the, uh, the Martin too. So this, this is my, my other guitar. And, uh, you know, if I had to pick, if I have to pick one guitar, it's, it'll usually be this one. Um, it's got the cutaway. Uh, it's got a little wider string spacing. Yeah. So this is also a custom, but it's basically an OM21. 
C, like what they would call an OMC 21? It's kind of like if Martin made OM 21s with a cutaway in uh, 1930, this might be what it would have been like. Yeah, it's basically um, it's basically like a like a Schomburg soloist, um, but uh, it was made by the Martin Custom Shop. Um, back in 2004 which is before they had the dedicated custom shop so everything that was custom went through the regular line but it sort of went to the best people and on each station that's kind of how it was explained to me at that time um and uh it is basically back then they were making the om 18 v and that's kind of what we started out with um and then we sort of changed everything uh but i think you know when we wrote up the custom order sheet you have to start somewhere and we started there because i wanted 18 style appointments um but um it has an adirondack top it has indian rosewood back and sides so that's kind of why it's sort of like a 21 style because it's a rosewood guitar but with 18 style appointments um, i remember the mahogany on the neck being particularly nice it's got it's got a mahogany neck yep uh and it's got the i've i've, I've I don't know what they call this. I think it might be the low oval shape. So it's not the V shape that a, a um, OM that an 18 V would have had, but it has the wide string spacing. So I think it's two and it's either three five sixteenths or three. I think it's three eighths actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that that was an important thing for me. Um, again, fingerboard with no fingerboard inlay. It does have side dots. That's kind of it in terms of the custom specs on this guitar. At the time, I, I worked with Dick Boke on this and he picked out the woods for me and uh, Tim Teal uh, also was involved in building this. And so uh, it's a marvelous guitar. It's a really, really good OM. Yeah, I asked the custom shop to make me a guitar with no fretboard inlays and they said, we shouldn't do that for you. <laughs> well, actually, my first Martin was ordered without fretboard inlays. It would basically been an MC-18. It was okay. ordered by Morris Music and it arrived with fretboard inlays and they had to redo the fretboard oh. for me. So they don't like, I guess they don't like them that way. But, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, on this one, I had originally um, specified a bridge with uh, the more modern bridge with the closed... Um, with the closed endings on the saddle and it showed up with a vintage style saddle uh it's still a drop in and uh that was fine uh, when i opened the box i kind of went oh it's not exactly what i had said but uh and they said at the time well we can put a new bridge on there for you but you probably shouldn't let us do it and uh, i agreed <laughs> so <laughs> so did you ever so you have not put an under saddle pickup in it then no, it does. It has... Um, oh, even with the wings, you can do that. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, it's no problem, because it's a drop-in saddle. So this guitar has a uh, Bags Anthem in it. Before that, when I first got it, I had the earlier Bags Dual Source in it, which had the ribbon transducer. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's had a couple of different under-saddle pickups in it. Yeah, so, that, so that's no problem. Uh, these, these ones, since they're drop-in, they're not glued in. You can put any under-saddle pickup in there. Yeah, I thought maybe the length of the slot was a problem, but I guess it doesn't have a long slot, really. Those are just cosmetic wings at yeah, the top. Yeah, I forget. I, I mean, I, I put it in. I drilled the hole myself, uh, but um, I, I forget. I don't think it's at the very end. I think the, you know, the hole for the pickup is actually drilled where it would be on a, on a regular saddle, so really just below the, the last bridge pin there. Very cool. Nice. Well, yes, great guitar. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a wonderful guitar. It's got Waverly tuners. Um, it's been refretted a couple of times now. Uh, and, you know, it's, yeah, it's 20, this year it'll be 20 years old this fall. So, yeah. Wow. Um, so it's, it's got a few battle marks and, uh, you know, that's how I like it. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> you should see mine. It's, it, it's, it's good. It's, it's really good. So do you typically play... Um, Long scale guitars, or do you have a combination? Do you play? I typically play long scale guitars. Really, the only short scale guitar I have is I have a Larry V Parlor, um, huh. and uh, that's kind of my couch guitar. But yeah, you know, with all the tunings that I use, I find having um, the little the long scale really helps with the drop tunings. I find it's uh, short scale guitars. You tend to run into intonation issues a little bit more when you drop your tunings. I can attest to that. I converted from OMs to mm. short scale for my hands in later years. Mm -hmm. And you also get traffic jams up above the cutaway, too, because the frets are so close together. I but wouldn't, uh, you know, sometimes I think, well, if I've, 
it, I wouldn't mind having a short scale guitar and just keep it in standard tuning for, for that kind of stuff. Um, like you know, every time I play Eric Sky's Santa Cruz, I'm going, yeah, one of these would be really nice to have. Um, and uh, then I see how much they are. Uh, but uh, you know, that is a fantastic guitar. Uh, Eric's, Eric's a dear friend and I've spent a lot of time with him playing his guitar. And uh, one of those would do, yes. <laughs> Rather nicely. <laughs> <laughs> he plays pretty good too, if I remember correctly. Uh, he's a wonderful player, of course. Yeah, it's funny. I got to meet him at, at one of the, probably the same Nam show that, or, that we met you at, and he and uh, Mark Goldenberg were playing at uh, I think it was the Hilton stage. Oh yeah, and I remember it, I, it was such a when you say something so dumb in front of the wrong people, it sort of haunts you all yeah. your life. And I said, man, you guys are awesome. If I could play like you, I would play all day long, every day. And they looked at each other. Yeah. We do. We do. <laughs> right. Of course you do. Mark is unbelievable. Uh, you know, we, we, he has a course with us on Peghead Nation. He has a guitar theory course. And um, oh. so he goes, he goes through all this, you know, he studied with Ted Green doing all this chord theory stuff. And he really, he's a wonderful teacher. And in his course, he really relays all the sort of chord and scale theory and how it all works out. And in the sessions, he would show up and he really have nothing sort of prepared that he would show us. And yet he was the most organized teacher in the moment, just going through every inversion, everything on. Now we'll do it on these strings. Now we'll do it on those strings. So for people who are into, uh, who want to learn more about chord theory on the guitar, his, his course on Peghead Nation is really fantastic. And, uh, you know, people wow. who aren't familiar with Mark, you know, he played in Jackson Brown's band for 17 20 years he played with yeah. peter frampton he's played with pretty much everyone i mean uh, it's pretty entertaining to go to allmusic.com and uh, see all the credits that he's the kind of guy who says i think i'm on a dylan record but i don't know which one and uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's he's pretty phenomenal. And uh, that record with Eric Sky that he did, actually, it's funny you should mention it because I just pulled it out last week because I hadn't heard it for a while, and it's such a wonderful album of of guitar music. And sort of to oh, their yeah. credit, they recorded that. Eric was saying like before lunch, like they literally went to the studio in the morning and they were done by lunchtime. They just knocked that thing out. God. So wow. that is pretty remarkable, and they're both such incredible players. And uh, here here's a fun funny story. Uh, I was hanging out at Eric Schoenberg's place with Mark one time and we're playing guitars and you know he's sounding really good and we're swapping instruments and he hands me this guitar he's like check this out and I'm trying to play it with him and it's like a quarter step flat and there's no way I could play it in tune. Well Mark just bent everything in tune. You would have never known he was out of tune. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and when you are a sideman to the stars like he has been you being out of tune is your problem. You have to deal with it. And he has learned to do it to a way where I would have never known. That's astounding. Yeah, it's wow. totally astounding. Yeah. His, the guitar was literally a quarter step flat and he just bent every note into tune and wow. I would have never known until I picked up the guitar. That's the kind of player he is. I can bend something out of tune, but it's really hard to bend. Well, out yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So that's great. You got to see him and Eric because they haven't been working together for a while. Uh, I think mostly just because of logistics, you know, Eric being in Portland and Mark being down in L.A. Sure. Well, do me a favor. Let me ask you this. Can we ask you to play a little bit on that Martin guitar and then come sure, back yes. to your story about I don't want to forget to ask you about all the lessons in all the uh, infrastructure at Peghead Nation, so sure. I can't let you off the hook without playing that before we do that much. Yes, okay, well I'll play a tune that uh, I dedicated to my dad. This is a tune called uh, The Ninth of August. And this is in Dad Got Tuning.
<laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bob. Does that inspire you, Spoon, or does it make you want to throw your guitars away? Ah, you shouldn't say that. I remember somebody came up to Lawrence one time after a show and said that. He said, why would you say that? He says, how often do you practice? And the guy said, I try to practice a couple hours a week. And he said, I played six hours a day for all the way through music school. You know, how you can't right. expect to play like I, like I play. <laughs> but yeah, no, Taylor's always had a very creative awesome. use of the alternate tunings and takes advantage of the, you know, the registers. Uh, sometimes playing rhythm up and sometimes playing rhythm down in the bass and vice versa. That's always really enjoyable to watch. Yeah, well, they, you know, I, I mean, it's anytime you arrange something, whether it's something that is uh, that you wrote or that you didn't write. I mean, I think some something that is sometimes forgotten that when you write a piece, there's still an arranging process that is just the same as if you arrange someone else's piece, and uh, you know finding different ways to play the same idea is is an important part of that and uh that you know that's something that happens several times in a piece like this yeah absolutely so do you have a preference in strings for flat top acoustic guitars or do you use different strings for different guitars how you um i like the dadgat sets uh i just bought 20 sets of the dario dadgat phosphor bronze set so i guess <laughs> i like those um the phosphor uh, bronze, yeah yeah. Which is, I, f I think the EJ twenty sixes. Is that what they're called? I forget now. Um, they are basically a light gauge set, but with a thirteen and a seventeen for the first and second, and a fifty six on the bottom. Um, yeah, new tone. The first time I ran into that was over in England with new tone. Did that? Okay, um, so yeah. it's ideal for that guy because those are the ones you tune down. I actually like having the heavier trebles even in standard tuning, and the seventeen. You know, I play and uh, I tune it up to C quite a bit, uh, and it still works for wow. that. I could probably use a heavier bass string than a 56, and I have in the past, sometimes when I've recorded, I'd get like a 59 if I'm d tuning down to C or something like that. But in reality, these dad gut sets are pretty ideal. And I'm also fine just playing a, a, a standard light gauge set. I mean, they work in all the tunings that I do. I can play a 12 to a 53 and, and it's okay. You might have to adjust your touch a little bit uh, to, to do it. I will say that uh, my guitars have higher action than what a lot of people would find comfortable. And that is because when you use so many alternate tunings and you use slack strings, you can basically never have your guitar set up ideally for each one of those tunings. So you have to find a compromise. And having the action slightly higher um, is sort of a necessity for that. Uh, so sometimes I'll have people picking up my guitars and they're going, it's kind of high action. That's not to say that it's crazy high, uh, but it's definitely not like, like low, low, low. I think you might have found the two people that like that, though. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I don't. You know, every time I have to review the modern guitars, I think they're all made set up for people who grew up playing electric guitars, and I much prefer the old, older, higher action. For but basically for the same reason for Dad Gad or Celtic C or whatever. It just it's just important. Uh, you know, it it it's really such a personal kind of thing. I mean, like Eric Schomburg, like super low action, and uh, you know his guitars play wonderfully. Um, but if I drop them down into C or that guy, they can get a little buzzy. Uh, so it's just sort of a compromise that I found for myself that I do like action that's just slightly higher. And, uh, you know, I, I've... Uh, I'm not that picky about string brands, uh, the gauges, of course. I do tend to like Phosphor Bronze better than 8020 Bronze. Um, I think the uh, the Martin Lawrence Juber set, Dad got set, which I think is their Monell wound or something like that. That's also a really nice set. Uh, they, I was they after sound them great. for years to offer a Dad Gad set because I like their, their silk wound strings and I have to buy a medium and a light right. and mix them up. I like those Santa Cruz strings that they've come out with a lot. Um, those are great. Um, oh. But really, when it comes down to it, uh, I've played standard Phosphor Bronze uncoated Deiderios for so long. It's sort of like my frame of reference, mm, sure. and I really like them. I, because I change tuning so much, I tend to change strings before they sound really dead because I start worrying about breaking them. Uh, you know, the more you change tunings and you get the little kinks at the peg, you're just going to break strings more often. Yeah. So the super longevity to me isn't that big of a factor because I will usually um, change strings before they're dead. Mm. 
I had mentioned uh, Juber earlier. He, before he got his Martin deal, he used to use a GHS uh, Dead Gad mm-hmm. set. I remember that, yeah. Cryogenic or something. I don't know if you've ever yeah. ran into those yeah. or not. Yeah. Well, I, I've known uh, I've known Lawrence since the days when he was still playing mm. Taylor's and then Collings, mm. and um, so we we go back a long time. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And he just sent me a very nice note about the new album, so that was uh, so ah good. excellent. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So good. that's how you know it's well, good, or you know which <laughs> friends you have. But uh, <laughs> speaking about going back in time, right before you played your uh, custom yeah. Martin for us, we talked about Peghead Nation. Can you please help our listeners and our viewers? Get an idea of what that's all about? Yeah, so Peghead Nation is a subscription-based online lesson environment, essentially. Mm-hmm. We have almost 70 courses now with 30 different instructors. Uh, from guitar, uh, on the guitar side, uh, one of my co-founders, Scott Nygaard, has several flat-picking courses. Scott's a wonderful flat-picker. used to play with, you know, Tim O'Brien and uh, Laurie Lewis and toured with John Baez and uh, solo mm. artist as well, uh, amazing player. I host a uh, advanced fingerstyle workshop with uh, various different guest artists, including uh, uh, Tim Sparks, Sean McGowan, Muriel Anderson, a um, uh, bunch of fantastic players. Eric's guy is in there. Uh, Matt Monasteri is teaching a couple of great jazz and uh, Western swing jazz courses with us. Uh, Stevie Coyle is teaching a fingerstyle guitar course. Steve Boffman is doing claw hammer guitar. We mentioned Mark Goldenberg's course. Uh, Orville Johnson has a blues guitar course. That's just on the guitar side. And I'm, uh, Flint Cohen does a couple Irish backup and Irish flat picking courses. So there's a lot of courses. I'm, I'm, I'm not even covering them all. Uh, we're really strong in the mandolin world. Um, we have courses with John Reichman, Sharon Gilchrist, Joe K. Walsh, uh, Mike Compton. Again, lots of fantastic teachers, really focused on the roots music, old time, bluegrass uh, thing for the most part. But again, we have some fingerstyle guitar, some jazz guitar, some, a lot of different courses. And basically it's a subscription based uh, thing. Uh, you, you, you pay, 20 bucks a month and you have access to your course and uh, if listeners are interested we have some promo codes you can uh, punch in uh, play 24 for a promo code you get the first month for free and uh, so it's a subscription based lesson environment but we also one of the things that separates us from a lot of lesson sites is that we do have kind of a magazine like environment with for example all the gear demos that we do you know uh, we, we have a new instrument demo every week most of which i do we have performance videos we have some blogs in there wow. and stuff like that and all that stuff uh, anyone has access to it's it's in front of the paywall so definitely come over to pegheadnation.com and just check it out so there's a ton of material so uh, we're going to have our 10th anniversary later this year and um, it's been it's been a great ride yeah. Congratulations. And I'm going to ask you a selfish question. Excuse me, Spoon. We're actually here at Mari's Music. We're in the process of trying to sell our business, and we'd like to get out of the retail side of things mm-hmm. and kind of transition to the podcast journalist side. Can I ask you, what was it like going from your acoustic guitar magazine job to a Peghead Nation type job? Not literally, but can you speak to the, the way it felt <laughs> going from one career to another, just, just for, really just for me? It is, there are similarities, of course, because there is still the guitar demo, guitar review, instrument, being in touch with all the makers and stuff like that aspect to it. I do a lot less writing than I used to do. Uh, you know, I used to not only cover gear, but I also did a lot of artist profiles and, uh, you know, wrote a lot of stories on both gear and, and artists. You've even written a book, as I recall. I've written, I've, well, I've, I wrote a book on Taylor guitars, uh, and I wrote, I've co-authored a few other books, um, and that was great. Uh, and I miss doing some of that, um, but I am so, you know, Peghead Nation is such a great thing, and I'm the producer, so I, I shoot and edit almost all the videos you see on the site. Uh, so I've sort of transitioned from being a writer to being a video producer. There's also the running the business aspect. At, at Acoustic Guitar, I was an editor and uh, I was not really involved in the greater business aspect of it. With Peghead Nation, uh, there's three of us, the three co-founders. It's my, like I mentioned earlier, it's myself, Dan Gable and Scott Nygaard. 
and we did all work at acoustic guitar before, but our tenure there sort of came to an end within five months or so of each other for, for different reasons for all of us. It just sort of ran its course. Of course, also print publishing is not exactly something to put your future into these days. So mm. uh, there's, there's an aspect of that where I'm sort of glad to have found a way yeah. to transition into something else. And, you know, that really is the satisfying thing. Um, the three of us are a great team. We have uh, complementary skill sets and, um, you know, we're friends and uh, you know, Maury, you've started a business, so you, you know it's very satisfying to grow something from the ground up and uh, 10 years later, uh, you know, it's supporting the three of us and uh, we're working with all these fantastic artists producing these lessons. I mean, I have to pinch myself sometimes being in the studio with some of our instructors who are not only among the very best people doing what they do, they love to teach it. and. Um, it's it's really quite magical a lot of times just to witness that uh, relaying of the information and that teaching and the amazing playing that that goes on. You know, being in the studio with John Reichman playing his uh, his Lloyd Lohr mandolin for an entire day is amazing. There's there's you know, nothing wrong. It's incredible. <laughs> so uh, so we have a lot of fun and it's been great to work that. Uh, so it, again, there are similarities to what I used to do at acoustic guitar and uh, a lot of things are quite different. Well, nowadays, the demo, you know, instrument demos are everywhere. Uh, yeah. Both Maury and I do it. A lot of people do it all over the place. Yeah. But almost everybody owes a debt of thanks to you from you being one of the real pioneers of that. And Well, thank you. And the way, if originally in print, and then when you moved, mm -hmm. you guys, you know, moved into the internet. And uh, I think that's... You know, you have quite a legacy when it comes to well, thank you. You know, giving very you know fair, unbiased, um, but still supportive of the you know instrument makers. Well, out well, there. appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's it's always a balance. Um, my philosophy about it is not so much to you know call out what's good or bad because the majority of guitars that are being made right now, they're great instruments. Uh, it's it's so rare that something really um, unusable comes across. So my my whole approach to it is to kind of figure out who is this good for. You know, who would really like this, and what kind of player would be served by this instrument. Um, and so that's sort of how I approach it. And uh, it's been you know I've been very fortunate to uh, have played and demoed hundreds, possibly thousands of guitars over the last 25 years. So, uh, You mentioned teaching and you also mentioned Murray, Muriel. Um, mm -hmm. When you play uh, your classical guitar, you're playing nylon mm -hmm. string guitar, gut string guitar, mm -hmm. do you approach it differently technique-wise other than you can't play them as hard as a steel string guitar or you basically unconsciously play them all the same? Um, I would actually say that I play my steel string more like a classical guitar than a lot of steel string, steel string players no. do. I never, I was never a serious, I never went to a conservatory or really, you know, studied classical guitar. But I did play nylon strings pretty much exclusively for a couple of years, like early on in my sort of finger style thing, uh, career. Oh. Studying some classical and some flamenco guitar and... Uh, and doing that and um, partially through my time in Mexico in Paracho where you know all the guitars are nylon string and I've always had a nylon string and there's times when I don't play it for a long time um, I have a really nice uh, Kenny Hill classical guitar that um, I didn't use on this last album but it's on a couple cuts on the duets album with Doug Young and, and I do like to bring it out to gigs uh, uh, from time to time. So my right hand technique is really much more like a classical guitarist uh, than a lot of steel string players. Um, well, I was wondering when I was watching you play, that's one of the reasons I asked if, you know, if you're basically using the same technique. I don't use a thumb pick. Um, I have relatively short natural nails, kind of like a class guitar player would. Uh, sort of, I think about my, my position of the right hand a lot and, and how it attacks the strings and, uh, and that kind of thing. I do play with the guitar on my right leg rather than the left leg like a class guitar player would. So it's kind of a hybrid, but definitely um, it informs my um, 
my my approach uh it really sort of because i was doing it so early in in playing basic guitar with my fingers playing solo guitar uh that basically informs everything else that i do even though now i mostly play in alternate tunings and on street string guitars i still fundamentally think of my technique as being more classical guitar derived than than say like uh you know uh, travis picking or chad atkins kind of derived no, thank you for answering. That's a great mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, I, I don't want you guys to think I, I'm fishing for compliments. I'm trying to be a good host or co-host. Uh, it was more than 15 minutes ago that you mentioned you bought 20 sets of Diodario strings. <laughs> yeah, I did. Normally, almost every week, whenever one of us says 20, we just slam on the brakes and we play a game called 20 Questions. Would you like to play 20 Questions with us today? Let's play... So we can do this one of two ways. You could think up a Martin guitar that's available for sale out there in the world today, and we can ask the 20 questions, or we can really put you on this, the hot seat. Right. And Put me on the hot seat. We've talked about this before. <laughs> okay, well, do you want me to pick? Yeah. Maury, do you want me to pick a, a Martin guitar that's available for sale in the world today? I would like nothing more than that right okay. now. Okay, well, I am thinking of a Martin guitar, and you have 20 questions, including three guesses of the possible model that are included in that 20 question count. Okay. And 20 questions are on the clock with our special guest now. Well, you, you're asking me, right? Oh no, you said you want to be on the hot seat, so you have to ask us. <laughs> oh, well, okay, see, I was confused. You do one first. Okay. All right. So, Spoon, is it made in Nazareth? Yes. Is it in the dreadnought shape? No. Is it short scale? No. Does it have a spruce top? No. Mm. Is it a triple O fifteen M? No. Is it a triple O fifteen SM? Yes. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> so you gotta beat you gotta beat six. All right. Yeah. That's on that's on record okay. now. Um right. so you want me to think of a model? Yes, you think of a model and we'll take turns asking the questions. Okay, ask me the questions. Yep. Twenty questions on the clock and Go. So our usual first question, is this guitar made in Nazareth, Pennsylvania? Yes. Does this guitar have a spruce top? Yes. Is this guitar made with a torrified top? Mm, I don't think so. I will say that's a no. Is this guitar in the standard series? Yes. Is this guitar built with the dreadnought body size? No. Is this guitar short scale? No. Is this guitar made with rosewood back and sides? Yes. Does this guitar have pearl on the back? Mm, don't think so. Wasted question. There aren't any 45s that aren't made in the dreadnought size. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, is this... I'm starstruck. Is this, Leave me alone. Is this an OM? No. Ooh, ah. Does this guitar have pearl anywhere? I, I mean, I should say abalone trim. Not, not like fingerboard, but abalone trim. No, no trim. Is this guitar an M36? It is indeed. <laughs> you have we have a winner. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Those of you listening to this podcast but if you're not watching, Spoon is gloating. Uh, the M36 is one of my favorite guitarists in the Martin line. Uh, I, um, I, you know, I've played them over the years from time to time, and they sent me one to demo a couple of years ago that was 
part of the whatever um the reimagined standard series i think is what it was and it was just a fantastic guitar i think those guitars are totally underrated um i think for whatever the list price on that thing was 3600 bucks 3500 bucks or something like that it was it had everything it was a great finger style guitar it was a great strummer it had power it had it was just a great guitar yeah and that would have, they would have just changed the one and three quarter inch nut at that time a friend of mine had one of the very early ones like from 1983 or something like that when did they come out i think wow. like 80 82 or something like that, that sounds, right? yeah because the m38 was probably 78 79 so I yeah exactly so. i think the 36 came out a little bit after that and so this friend of mine has one of those and i've just played him over the years in a lot of you'll find a lot of professional players having playing those guitars and um, mm. there's a good reason for that they're really comfortable to play um, I think it's a great body uh, size and shape and they just tend to be really versatile instruments well, I don't know if you remember that um, the Woody Mann signature model of course, that they yeah, came out with those were awesome that was an unbelievably great guitar and that sort of based on that it had mahogany back and sides and it was light as a feather yeah. and that was to me like, I think that came out like a year or two after I got this. And I was uh, thinking to myself, yeah. man, may maybe hole. I should have done something like that. That is oh, so great. Oh. <laughs> a, friend, a friend of mine who's a classical guitar player primarily just took uh, possession of his custom that was based on the Woody Man. Um, so, but, he, but he's got an even wider neck. But um, yeah, now you have Chris Martin to thank for the oh, M36 wow. because they, the company, many times have tried to get rid of it. And he's insisted that it stay in the line for, as a legacy model. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I think it should always at least one M. It seemed like for a while they were pushing that M model, that size for a little bit a um, few years ago. And it seems like now sort of the, the GP seems to have taken that place a little bit more. But I've always really liked that M or quadruple O uh, concept. As a matter of fact, I, when I mentioned I was at Eric Schoenberg's earlier this week and uh, he had a recent uh, conversion that someone had done, an archtop conversion. Ooh, to a flat those are awesome. Um, that was incredible, uh, which is, of course, how uh, that whole M size, quadruple M size thing started, right? Uh, when back uh, when um, Matt Umanoff was doing those in the, in the 70s. That's right, with their, uh, Schoen, I mean, uh, so, Bromberg. Yeah. Um, and I think John Lund yeah, and, Lundberg, <clears throat> and Lundberg's guitars were also doing them, I think. But um, yeah, I think they were. And Mark Silber was involved in that whole thing. And they were just fantastic instruments. And uh, every now and then you come across one and they can be really incredible. I think our friend Len has a conversion, didn't he? Have yeah, he's got, he's got a conversion. He's an M-size conversion that, um, that he bought that way. He, just, he found it. I don't remember if it was a Vintage Instruments or Mandolin Brothers, but he just bought it. Yeah. And it's spectacular. Yeah. And it's from the yeah. year with the fretboard where they still had those little white lines. Going down. Yeah, that's how like, this one. That's how this one was that I saw at Eric's. Yeah, so I forget what archtop that started out with. Was it like the F seven? Is that what it? What I they think were so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I know. Collins used to copy that. Yeah, yeah. it's Collins very cool. used to offer guitars with that. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Spoon. Sometimes I say you know what the music means, but we're not exactly there yet. But we are going to tell you what the music means in a different way. Uh, shame on us for burying the lead. Let's talk about this new album. Taya, tell <laughs> us about the test of time having passed the test of 20 questions. Right. So, <laughs> test of time, which I happen right, to have right here. We, I still have some CDs made. Of course, it's also available on, in all the digital formats. It's my new solo album. It's my third solo album. Uh, it took me a while to get to this one. It's basically a collection of tunes that I've written and in some cases played for the last 15 years since my Postcards album came out. And uh, I'm really proud of it. I think um, it really reflects the way I put on a live show. It's got some six string guitar, but mostly six string. I, we talked earlier, uh, a couple of 12 string cuts. I'm playing a slide guitar piece on a national tricone as well on it. And it's been getting some great reviews. Um, Acoustic Guitar gave me a great review. There's a great review uh, that came out in a German magazine. And um, like I said, Lawrence Juber liked it. Uh, Tim Sparks liked it. <laughs> and uh, it's mostly recorded at home, uh, except for two tracks, which I recorded at Doug Young's place. And Doug mixed and mastered it, and he did a fabulous job with it. So um, that's you know, cool. quite, quite happy with how it came out. So it's all solo finger star guitar. Uh, I'm in alternate tunings for the entire thing. Um, 
which is actually a first. All my other albums have at least one standard tuning tune on them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, this guitar and the Loudon that we saw earlier are both on it. And yeah, I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm quite proud of it and I think it came out really nice. Well, from what I've heard of it already, I really like it. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that uh, before that, my last record before that was the duets album with Doug Young. And um, I'm already now formulating what the next one might be like. So, Spoon knows that Lori and I like to go to Cape Cod as often as we can, at least once a year. And when I got that duet CD, it must have been oh. right around the same time. Yeah. Uh, I'm listening to it and we're driving home and it's like an eight hour ride. And, and more than once she said to me, seriously, did this repeat? She, uh, <laughs> she wasn't listening like I was. <laughs> my do my teenage daughter thinks that, you know, I know one song and they all have different names, but uh, yeah. Well, at least Lori knew there were different names, but you know, I'll never forget how that sounded the first time yeah. I listened to that all the way. Anyway, over, you know? yeah, that, that was a fun one. You guys should have Doug on, on the show sometime. Oh, we would love that. Yeah, I'm sure cool. he'd be game. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. think so? Twist his arm for us. We'd love to have him on. I'll, I'll shoot him a note. Yeah, uh, he's... he's uh, he's very agreeable and uh, very knowledgeable, and he has probably one of the most incredible collections of luthier-made sort of fingerstyle guitars uh, of anybody. It's oh. really quite impressive. Oh, you think yeah. so? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, wow. uh, it's uh, pretty pretty incredible. Uh, I mean, on the on the duet CD, which I don't know if you can see, but we have a little picture of all the guitars that we used on that, which is 12 guitars. Ooh, and wow. just in just. that alone of his, there's uh, his Claxton, his um, uh, Yamamoto, his, uh, I think he played his Kathy Wingard. He's got a couple of Kent Hamblins. He does have a Traugott. He's got two Ryans. Um, so, yeah, he, he'd be worth talking to. Wow. Well, your your Loudon was obviously made by George because it's that that old. Well, no, it's it's actually it's from that in between shop which now they call the licensing shop. Um, so it's it. Oh, when they were trying to when somebody was investing in them to go na international. I refer to it as being you know the earliest. It's like the early ones, but not by ninety nine they were in the in the Newton Art shop and. Oh, that's right. You said yours was 2000. Mm. That's right. I'm sorry. Well, do you have any uh, in, in, independent luthier um, guitars in, well, your, I, I, in your home? I, my baritone, which is made by a local guy here, uh, Mario Deseo, who is not very well known, mostly builds guitars for folks here in the Bay Area, and he built me a fantastic baritone. Um, which I use a lot in the duo. Uh, I don't use it so much for playing solo. Um, my Kenny Hill classical is, you know, a luthier made guitar. Um, and um, those are, yeah, uh, those are kind of it. You know, I, I love luthier made guitars uh, and I'm friends with so many luthiers and there's almost nothing I like more than hanging out in luthier shops and mm -hmm. smelling the wood and seeing what they're doing. <laughs> um, I have really lucked into these two steel string guitars that really suit what I do and I've been playing them for so long. Um, that I'm sort of I'm sort of gasless, as they say, when it comes to uh, six string flat top guitars. <laughs> three of us are all around guitars all the time, but of the three of us talking today, I would think you have the opportunity and sometimes the responsibility to try so many guitars as your job. You don't get tempted. Well, I think that's part of it, though. I think because I play so many guitars and, uh, you know, people send me stuff to demo and I do spend time with it, it sort of takes that urge off to have some, to keep finding something new for myself. Uh, you know, I, I get the pleasure of playing new instruments all the time. I don't have to own them. <laughs> You know what I mean? I think if I didn't have that, I would be feeling more itchy to like, how about this? How about that? Uh, I, um, I do really feel that sort of bonding with an instrument and really learning to play a certain type of guitar is a really important part of developing your own tone and your own approach to to the instrument. A lot of you know great players have done that. I mean, I'm thinking folks like Pierre Ben Suzan, who's played the same Loudon for 40 years, basically with a couple of different diversions. Martin Carthy played wow. that Martin Triple O 18 for decades. You know, Tony oh. Rice with his Martin. In my case, it's sort of two guitars, but um, I think there there really is something. The other thing is, I think. 
you can fool yourself easily to uh, think you're becoming a better player with a new instrument. I think uh, these are, you know, to me, these two are kind of standards that a lot of amazing music has been recorded with Martin O.M.'s and Martin Loudon's. And if I can sound good on these instruments, the problem is probably with me, not with the instruments. So <laughs> I, I really, I think, um, I think the metronome is probably, a, you know, a, a stronger wow. way to get better than, uh, than necessarily a new instrument. Well, where's the fun in talking about metronomes, though, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> anyway, that's not to say that, you know, uh, it, I mean, I've, so, I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, I've been fortunate playing all these different guitars, like when I ordered this, I knew exactly what I wanted, and I didn't have to buy 10 guitars to figure out what it was that I wanted, because... I've been playing all these other guitars, so sort of achieving Good what point. you know what I like to do. Um, I'm I have the sort of luxury to be able to do that without having to horse trade all the time and try this. You know, I buy this, and then six months on the road, I say, oh, you know, I don't really like that wider string spacing. Well, by the time I ordered this guitar, I'd played a bunch of guitars for extended periods of time that just didn't happen to belong to me to know that I really liked that. Yeah. You know, so so that is that is definitely a perk of the job. Yeah, a lot of my close friends are reminding me that when this business does sell, I'm going to take for granted that I could finish this podcast, go upstairs, have my <laughs> pick of 100 guitars. A year ago, it was 200 guitars. And in right. the next year, it might be 10. And when they're gone, I have to make yeah. sure that I'm really happy with my OM28V, my D45, you know, my 0028. So I've, I probably should play more of these guitars sooner than later. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's you're in a different spot where at least you know you're not going to own any of them. I own all yeah. of these until they're gone. And, and one might be here for, for, I mean, there might be a triple <laughs> 012 e here for seven more years and it's going right. to be mine until someone takes it. So. Right. But. So, you know, I, 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 these, these two guitars are kind of the ones, uh, I mean, you know, again, the loud I've had for 25 years, this one I've had for almost 20 and uh, there really hasn't been a time where I'm going, I really need something else uh, in, in that time. Yeah. And, um, and I don't really foresee that happening, uh, you know, uh, unless something really, <laughs> strange happens or some kind of new musical need arises right uh that that could always happen uh, like we talked sure. about um you know short scale guitars if i suddenly decide i'm going to play in standard tuning all the time and uh i want to do some finger style guitar that way uh, maybe a short scale guitar i would by the way i know we're running long on this but have you played any of the martin s body size models the you mean those new scs yeah yeah, well, I've only played the original batch that came out, and I'm waiting for them to send me one of the 18s or the 28s, which I'm really yeah, looking forward to. I have to say, I, yeah, I, you know, I was in, in that on that project going back to the prototypes, mm -hmm. and they're now mm -hmm. they're finally figuring out how to use solid wood without feedback issues when you really tune up. I've noticed my friend Jack Stotzem in Belgium, uh, who's a fantastic fingerstyle player, started using one of the oh, 28s. Yeah. Uh, and he's had a signature model that he's played for a long time. So he seems to be switching from his OM signature model to one of the SC28s. Um, uh -huh. So I took note of that because he's an incredible fingerstyle player. And so I'm looking forward to playing, uh, playing one of those. Well, what, what made me think of that is when you play them, it's a, fish, it's a long scale. Right. Because it's 13 frets, everything's a little closer, and it doesn't yeah. feel like a long scale until you get up where you really need the room, and that's yeah. it's really mm. quite. Uh, I do uh, 13 fret nice. guitars do confuse me a lot of times, uh, but um, uh, you get used to anything. <laughs> true enough. We'll have to pick enough. a 13 fret guitar on a future episode of 20 Questions with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that the only 13 fret guitar Martin makes? I think so, yes, right? That, no, well, they make a b variety of now, them now in that yeah, size. Yeah, but, but it's all in that, that thing, right? I yes. think they're, aren't their bases 15 frets? Oh, I don't know. Oh, see, there's a trivia question. I think their acoustic bases may be 15 frets to the body. Hmm. And apparently they made a 13 fret guitar in the 20s okay. or something as a, you know, for somebody. Well, because so it's, because you know, Nick like Lucas, somebody, probably, they, they wanted to do that too. Well, this has been awesome indeed. Uh, so, One more question I'm going to throw your way, and you probably don't know. My sister and my mom visited California two weeks ago. Did you see them? 
Uh, probably. <laughs> I just didn't know it. <laughs> but, but he's really good at hiding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where were they? Uh, they they made it a point to visit uh, L.A., San Diego, San Francisco, and all points in between, mostly looking for Warren Zevon's grave and a lot okay. of the things that the Grateful Dead did. So they probably went past your neighborhood once. <laughs> well, if they came, if they entered the Grateful Dead, they probably did come up to Marin, uh, which is where I am. So perhaps. Well, now that we're all three friends, I'm going to make sure they bring me next time. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Spoon, I really do hear the music in the distance this time. Taya, I want to thank you very much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to take you up on your offer to talk about some more people like Doug Young and the like. You should definitely get Doug on. Yep. Thank you very much. We appreciate Excellent. your time. Spoon, thank yeah. you again for everything. And I did fail to say at the beginning of the program, this episode's brought to you by our Patreon family. Please join our growing community and enjoy early access to every episode, backstage content, exclusive videos, and more. And if you're doing that on this episode, you got to see at least two big screen versions of Taya playing that beautiful Martin guitar, that awesome Loudon. There's a real reason to get plugged in and find the backstage content. From all of us at Martin's and more, thanks for listening. Hear you later. Hope to see you maybe at a NAMM show sometime soon or uh, somewhere around the uh, acoustic guitar circles. I can dig it. Mm -hmm.